I'm going to give you 10 reasons why I think this might be my new favorite game of all time. Firefly 10th Anniversary Collector's Edition, how to play, and then I'm going to show you how to win. Today, we're going to learn how to play Firefly 10th Anniversary Collector's Edition with every expansion. Oh, ma, tell me ma. Hi, my name is Alex. This is Operation Game Table, a new channel about board games where I focus on board game strategy. The strategy failed. Before we go any further, make sure you stay watching until the very end where I'm going to talk about my future plans for the channel and some board game giveaways. That's right, free game. I'm going to start with how to set up and play the base game, and then I'll show you how to add each expansion to the game one at a time in order. After I've explained how to set up and play the game, I'm going to go over game strategy. I've researched the internet and board game geek threads to see what other players' strategies are, and I've developed kind of my own little strategy. So I'm going to show you what my strategy is, and I'm going to give you my two cents on the other strategies I've found on the internet. I'll finish with going over things that I like about the game, things I don't like about the game, and why this is one of my favorite games right now and where this game ranks in my current board game collection and it's up there. And I did put the timestamps down below so you can go ahead and jump ahead to whatever section you want to jump to or just watch the whole thing through all the way. That's the best thing to help me in the channel. Before we set up the game, I'm going to tell you who we are, what we're doing in the game, how do we win, and why is it going to be fun. In this game, we each get to fly our own little spaceship right here, a little Firefly class spaceship, a little transport ship. We get to fly it around the map, do, 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 go to different planets. When we get to the planet, if the planet has a little name under it, that means you get to do something there. So these, those are the planets you want to go to. So these little planets, this one says Osiris, that means that you can go to the Osiris Shipworks over here and you get to look through the deck and pick things that might be crew members. You can find items. You can find a lot of different things in there that you can purchase to help you out in the game. When you fly to another planet, there might be jobs available. And the whole point of the game, just like in the movie or in the show, Firefly, you find a crew, you find a job, and you keep flying. Find a crew, find a job, keep flying. We're each our own captains of a Firefly ship. Here's a board that we get, and on this board, you get to pick up passengers, you can pick up fugitives. You wanna keep your fugitives in your stash down here where it's hidden. Contraband goes in your stash. Cargo can go up here. Doesn't matter if anybody sees that. You've got fuel tokens, you gotta to have fuel to fly and parts just in case something breaks down you got to be able to replace it you can upgrade your ships here's your jobs your active jobs go over here over here this is where your crew is you can have a maximum of six crew some things let you have more crew like one of these ship upgrades ship upgrade expanded crew quarters plus three the ship's max crew and you make money so you do jobs you make money you make the most money you're probably gonna win the game. There's other objectives, there's different story cards, so every time you play, it's gonna be a little bit different. Look at the story cards, decide which story you're gonna play that game, and you have to look at the goals, which goal you're gonna do in each game. So how do you win is by completing the goals on the story card. So in this story card, there's three goals. If you complete all three goals first, you win the game. Now, why is this gonna be fun? This game, they have played it at different player counts, and every time I've played it, I've wanted more. It's a bit of a table hog. It takes a little bit of time to set up, but it's an epic game and it's got an epic amount of fun. So let's get to it. Let's get to it. So as you're flying around in space through each one of these territories, every time you move to a different spot, you have to draw a card over here. So if you're moving through Alliance space, you draw an Alliance space card, and that might be something that says, just keep flying, or there might be something that you have to do. Maybe something broke down. Maybe you have to spend a part to keep flying. Maybe you're just broken down and you have to stop and lose your turn. You don't know, the cards decide. 
Same thing in border space, there's different things. Maybe the reaver's gonna come after you. You gotta watch out for the reavers. You gotta watch out when you're going through Alliance space. You don't want the Alliance shuttle to come after you. That'd be bad. You don't want the Alliance shuttle to come after you. Oh, and then one of the goals in the game, some of the jobs that you have to do, have you aim to misbehave? These aim to misbehave cards, you gotta roll dice. You gotta roll dice to see how big a roll you get. If you get a big enough roll, you'll win. But a lot of them take a lot. You have to you have to get crew to help you have better rolls. So the crew have dice modifiers on them that will increase your chances of winning your dice roll for these aim to misbehave cards or for other cards. Sometimes you have to roll a dice for the alliance space. Sometimes you have to roll a dice for the border space. There's different times where you're gonna have to roll dice, different types of dice rolls, and your crew are gonna modify those dice to make your chances better if you have the right crew. When you get your crew, you have to hire your crew crew it costs money to hire the crew and every time you do a job you have to pay the crew and then each crew can carry one item unless they have something that says they can carry two items and you can get different items for the crew like a pistol firearm a sniper rifle get a space jeep look at that that's pretty cool what else can you get? Uh, one of your crew you can get is a mutter. The mutters are basically slaves, and if you're an immoral person, you could actually go to a planet and sell the slave for five times what you paid for him. Is that right? Is it moral? It makes you money. And something recently I learned, I didn't know this before, but slave comes from the term Slavic, as in the Slavic people, as in the very first slaves were the Slavs, the Slavic people, the white people. That's crazy, I didn't know that. And don't forget about the coolest part of the game, the first player token, this little dinosaur right here. So cool. We will rule over all this land, and we will call it this land. The money, look how big the money is. The money's awesome. I think we should call it your grave. Ah, curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal. So without further ado, let's go ahead and see how to set up the game. to misbehave. So the first thing you have to know to play the game is there's four actions you can take on your turn. You can fly, buy, deal, or work. 
Flying means moving your ship, moving your ship around the board. You can fly in two different ways. You can either mosey, which means you get to just move one space. If you mosey, you only move one space, but you don't have to draw a navigation card. So that saves you from some possible headache right there. If you choose to do a full burn, then you have to spend one of your fuel tokens and you can move up to your drive core's maximum range, which usually it's five. If you spend a fuel token, you'll spend your fuel token, you'll throw it, and then you'll 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 throw it in your bin. I threw it on the ground. He threw him on the ground. And you'll move five spaces, one, two, three, four, five, but every time you move a space, you have to draw a navigation card and see what comes up. See if it's keep flying. A lot of them, most of them are these. They say keep flying, but every once in a while you'll get one where you have to choose one option or the other, and it could be bad news. But how do I choose? Or sometimes there are good things. If you're on a planet that has a corresponding supply deck, then you can choose to do a buy action. On your buy action, you can buy parts and fuel anywhere you are. You can always buy parts and fuel. And if you have disgruntled tokens, which we'll talk about that later, but the little disgruntled tokens, you can choose for your buy action to send all your crew on holiday and all their uh, disgruntled tokens go away. And that costs, that's called shore leave and it costs $100 for each crew, including your captain, and then all the disgruntled tokens go away. So that's good to have if you have a moral crew and you're doing immoral jobs, you're getting a lot of disgruntled tokens on your crew, you can always go to a planet, choose for your buy action, shore leave, wipe out all those disgruntled tokens, and you're good to go. For your buy action, you're going to consider three cards and choose two. So, if you look over to the supply decks over here, you might already have some in the discard pile. You're allowed to go through the entire discard pile. It's like you're shopping. You can look through any of those that you want to consider, and you can consider one, two, or three of those. Any less than three, you can draw from the deck itself. So, say I wanted to consider one of these cards, then I could still draw two cards from the deck just to see what these new ones are. Now I'm considering three cards. I can look at those cards and decide which ones I want to buy, and then I can put the rest in the discard pile for other people to look at and use later. You can choose to buy up to two of the three cards you're considering. The other action you can choose to do is to deal. When you deal, you're gonna be on a planet that has one of the contacts that you can choose to make a deal with. So if you're on a planet that says Patience, for instance, then you would draw Patience cards, and it's the same thing as with the buy action. You're gonna draw three, choose two. So if there's any in the discard pile, you can look through the discard pile. You can choose from one of those. You can choose to consider one of those and draw from the deck up to three, so you're considering three. Then you're gonna pick two of those jobs to add to your hand. Now you can only have three inactive jobs in your hand at a time. You can't draw more than three. If you're already at three, you're at your max, you can't draw any more than that. Same thing with active jobs. You can have three active jobs that you're working on. And that brings us to our fourth action that you can do, which is to work. At any point during the game, if you're at a spot that it says that you need to be, so for instance, this job says that I need to be at New Hope, Georgia. So I would have to fly to, where is Georgia on here? So here's Georgia in the game right over here. And you have to fly to New Hope, which is right over here, New Hope, Georgia. And then you would have to misbehave to load three fugitives. So misbehave two cards. You'd have to draw two of these misbehave cards. You'd draw two misbehave cards. And if you are able to proceed past both of them, usually you gotta roll some dice Hopefully you got some crew that helps you out with those dice rolls. If you pass both of those tests, then you get to load your fugitives. Then you still have to fly to Motherload Red Sun. So you got to go halfway across the galaxy to Red Sun, Motherload Red Sun, and deliver the three fugitives. And then you can do a negotiate roll to get paid possibly even more money. So this is $3,500 plus you might make another $1,000. That's $4,500. Plus if you have a medic, you get an extra $400. But don't forget, after you do your job, you still have to pay your crew. So don't forget to look at your crew. If you have a lot of crew, you might be paying $1,000 or more for your crew. 
If you forget to pay your crew, they become disgruntled and you get a disgruntled token. You don't want those. If you get two disgruntled tokens on the same crew member, then they jump ship and they end up back in the discard deck. And if they have one disgruntled token and another Firefly ship comes in your sector, they might be able to take your disgruntled crew member on board their ship and steal them for their crew. If you successfully complete a job for one of the contacts you're working for, then you become solid with that contact and then you get the benefit on the back of the card. For instance, this is Niska, and if you become solid with Niska, then if you are ever issued a warrant while working a Niska job, you have to kill a crew. So that's bad. Usually you have good benefits, but also if you are solid with Niska, you can sell contraband for $800 per contraband token you have. That's a lot. I think that's the best out of any of the contacts in the game. And you can sell regular cargo for $400. So each one of the, so each one of the contacts that you can deal with, like patients here, Patients will buy contraband for 600 and cargo for 500. So she does better than Niska for the cargo, but not as good for the contraband. If you are solid with patients, then you can consider four jobs when dealing with patients instead of just three. If you're solid with Harkin, then you can ignore the Customs Inspections nav card, which is a pretty big deal. If you're solid with Amandul, then you can load passengers and fugitives at the Space Bazaar with no limit. So that can help you in different jobs that you're doing. The last but often useful thing that you can do, if there's nothing that you can decide on doing and you just want to make some quick money, if you're on a planet, If your Firefly is in a sector with any planet, then you can do a work action called Make Work and just collect $200 from the bank. Sometimes in the game you'll receive a Warrant Token. These are bad. If you have a Warrant Token on your ship and the Alliance Cruiser ends up in the same sector as your ship, then you're going to have to pay $1,000 for each Warrant that you have. So you don't want Warrants. But if you're solid with Badger, when solid and dealing with Badger, you can pay $1,000 to clear all your warrants. So if you have more than one warrant, go visit Badger if you're solid with him, pay him $1,000 and get rid of all your warrants. That's a good thing to have. And if the game ever tells you to kill a crew, then that crew member is removed from the game completely, never to return again. But uh, wait, there's more. If you have a medic in your crew, then when that crew is killed, you can roll a die. On a one to a four, the crew member still dies. On a five or a six, the crew member is healed and returns to your ship. You saved my life. We should really talk about the player aid here that really helps out. This player aid tells you what to do when you come in contact with the Alliance ship or the Reaver ship. So if you're ever in the same territory, same sector of space as the Alliance ship or the Reaver ship, then you're going to have to resolve what's on this little player aid here. So Alliance contact, and this can happen from the reshuffle cards also. So if you get the reshuffle card in the deck, in the nav deck, then it automatically gets the Reaver or Alliance uh, directly to your sector. Alliance contact right there. Alliance Contact resolve immediately for outlaw ships. So you're an outlaw ship if you have any crew member that has a wanted symbol on their card. So if you have any wanted crew members or if you have a wanted token on your ship board, then you are an outlaw ship. That matters for the Alliance Contact. Resolve immediately for outlaw ships in Alliance Cruisers sector. So if you're not an outlaw ship and you happen to be in the same sector as the Alliance ship, you don't have to worry about doing any of these things. So you'll pay fines, $1,000 per warrant, and then you'll clear your warrants. All contraband and fugitives, so those are the red side of the tokens, are seized, including those in your stash, so they find your stash, and then you have to roll for each one of your wanted crew. If you have a wanted crew, you have to roll a die, and if you get a one, then that crew is removed from the game entirely. Put them back in a box. If you get a two through a six, then that crew member is safe, they avoid capture. And if you're flying, then you're gonna have to go to a full stop. Now, if you come in contact with the Reavers, 
Reverse. You'll have to resolve this side of the player aid, which says resolve when starting your turn in the reverse cutter sector. If you're very lucky, kill all passengers and fugitives. So those are the little suitcase tokens, whether it's the blue or the red side, they die. Then you have to roll a skill roll for your pistol symbol. So your fight symbol, you're gonna fight them and you need an eight. If you go, if you get a one through a seven, then you kill two crew before you evade. And if you get an eight or more, then you only kill one crew before you evade. And if you have a pilot and a mechanic, and this is huge in the game, this comes up quite frequently for me so far, you always want to try to have a pilot and a mechanic on your crew if you can. That's a good strategy tip for this game because you get to do crazy Ivans, and crazy Ivans come up in many different instances in the game. But Crazy Ivan, you spend one fuel and you evade, and you get to avoid all the other stuff. All right, so we're gonna talk about the ships right now. So, uh, ships that we have for this that you start out with, you've got the Green Bonanza, the Blue Bonnie Mae, the Artful Dodger is different than these. You've got the Yonki, that's the same, the Serenity. So the Serenity, the Yonki, the Bonnie Mae, and the Bonanza, those are four ships and they're all exactly the same layout. They have four cargo hold rows, or they have uh, eight spots in their cargo hold and four spots in their stash. And that's on all four of those, the Serenity, the Yonki, the Bonnie Mae, and the Bonanza. And then there's the Artful Dodger, the Artful Dodger, faster ship, it's slimmer but it has less space. So it still has four stash, but it only has six instead of eight of the cargo hold. I like this ship. Fanti? Mingo. He's Mingo. He's Fanti. You're Mingo.
The Breaking Atmo expansion adds new jobs to your jobs decks and it adds new supplies to your supply decks. On the new jobs, you'll see next to the Breaking Atmo symbol, when you get paid, you don't just get paid the pay amount, you'll also get paid an amount for every single symbol. So this one says you get paid $200 plus $200 per wrench in your crew. So you look through all of your crew and items cards and every single wrench symbol you have will give you another $200. So that adds up. Let's go over this again. The jobs will have a little symbol on there. So instead of just getting paid the normal amount, you'll have the normal amount you get paid plus you'll get $200 for each wrench symbol you have or whichever one it says. So this one says you'll get an extra $200 for each pistol symbol that you have. So you count up all the pistol symbols that you have on all your crew and all your items and $200 for every single one of those that adds up. The Big Damn Heroes expansion will add new versions of Malcolm, Zoe, Wash, Kaylee, and Jane that are identical to the old versions except for one thing. It'll say on there, when you proceed while misbehaving, take $100. So what that means is when you take one of these aim to misbehave cards and you get the proceed, which means you passed the test, then you get to take an extra $100 right then and there to add to your pile of cash. Oh, I, I like money. Yeah. Now, in the base game of Firefly, everyone's kind of flying around, everyone's doing their own thing, everyone's getting along. In fact, you might even be helping each other out by depending on where you're choosing to move the Reaver or move the Alliance vessel because everyone's just getting along, having a good time. Best friends forever. Well, not anymore. When you add the Pirates and Bounty Hunters expansion to the game, there's gonna be a heavy dose of aggressive player interaction. Oh, you're gonna be a pirate. Not everyone enjoys player conflict, so if you don't like playing this way, just don't add this expansion. But if you do like player conflict and more player interaction, this is the expansion for you. Pirate hats! Piracy jobs allow players to raid each other's ships and you can make off with their goods. You can steal their cargo, their contraband, their fuel, their parts. You stole my boat. And then in the Pirates and Bounties uh, addition, so when we get to Pirates and Bounties, you get a SS Walden, which is this ship here. And it comes with a lot of cargo space, but notice there is no stash. So nothing is hidden. Everything is out in the open, but there is a lot of space. That's kind of worth it because I haven't really noticed a whole lot of times where it mattered that I had a stash, but it does matter more in the Pirates and Bounties because of the fact that the players are trying to steal each other's things and you can't steal somebody's stash. So that's good to know if you're playing Pirates and Bounties and you have this one, you better not lose because they can steal whatever they want, but they can only steal as much as they have space for, and you got a lot of space here. So this is a good one to have in Pirates and Bounties. The other one is the Interceptor. The Interceptor also does not have a stash. It only has four spots in its cargo hold, but it's a very fast ship and you can re-roll any mechanic boarding tests. So, that's good. All right, so we're taking a look at the SS Walden. The SS Walden's drive core is this one here. So it only has a range of four, so that's less than the average, less than five. Unique core, it may not be replaced, so you can never change your core. You can't upgrade it with another drive core. But you are immune to a heavy load penalty, so it's a big ship and it can handle a heavy load. And then the Interceptor, the Interceptor's drive core is a range of eight. So this ship can move, it can haul, it can go fast, but you have a small amount of cargo space with only four spots in your cargo hold. All right, and here is the, this is the SS Walden. Come on, focus, come on, focus, there we go. Focus on that, there you go. This is the SS Walden right here, and this is the Interceptor. The SS Walden and the Interceptor. 
All right, and on the interceptor's drive core, eight, no fuel required to initiate a full burn. So you never have to have fuel on this ship. That is pretty cool. No fuel necessary. And the interceptor's drive core is also a unique drive core. You cannot replace it with any other drive core. You cannot upgrade it, one of a kind. <sighs> Pirates and Bounties also adds these bounty cards to the game. And if you apprehend and deliver the fugitives in these bounty cards, then you can get paid. So on this card here, it says, Fugitive Wanted, Helen, for the crimes of aggravated assault and manslaughter. Known associates are Nandy and Jane Cobb, last seen at the Space Bazaar. If on a rival ship, a boarding test is required, and you do a showdown dice action right there. If you win the showdown, then you apprehend Helen. If you lose, then you kill one of the attacker's crew. So you don't want to lose. It's immoral. You drop them off at New Hope, Georgia, and you get $2,600. That is a lot of money. So these cards offer a lot of money. Wanted Fugitive Jane, $3,600 for him. Want Fugitive Wanted Jesse, $2,600. $4,000 if you get River Tam. I got stupid. The money was too good. $2,600 if you get Simon Tan. Zoe, if you catch Zoe, you get $3,600. Anytime you wanna do a boarding test, anytime you're in the same sector as another Firefly and you want to board that vessel to maybe catch one of the fugitives you're looking for, you have to do a boarding test. So a boarding test, you have to choose either a tech or a negotiate skill. So the tech skill is the wrench and the negotiate skill is the little Chinese language symbol. Whichever one of those that you have the most of is the one you're going to choose, you're going to roll, and if you win, then you pass the boarding test and you've boarded that other player's vessel. How a showdown works is pretty cool. If you're ever having to do a showdown with another crew, that basically means that you and all of your crew are going to fight the other player and all of their crew. If you're the one initiating the attack, you're the attacker, they're the defender, and you're going to choose one of your three symbols that you have, either the pistols or the wrenches or the negotiate symbol. Whichever one of those is the highest is the one you, that you're going to want to choose. You're going to roll a die and you're going to add the number you get on your die to the total number of the symbols that you chose and that's going to be your attack score. Same thing for the defender, they get to choose any one of their symbols, whichever one they have the most of, they're going to roll their die. So say I have five pistol symbols and I've got four or something else and three or something else so I'm going to choose the five pistol symbols. I'm going to roll my die, I get a five, now I have ten. I'm going ten on my attack against the defender. The defender has uh, four of the negotiate symbol, rolls his die and gets uh, five. He loses, then I win the showdown. Now, if he got a six and we tied, if there's a tie, the defender wins. Did I win? No, I won, easily. If you're working a piracy job and you've completed a showdown, after completing the showdown and the piracy job, you have the option to steal. Everybody be cool, this is a robbery! From the other player, and you can steal as many spots as you have space for cargo. So if you have space for five cargo, you can steal five cargo from that other player. You can't steal more than you have space for. But you can choose to jettison parts or fuel or cargo or passengers if you're on a planet sector in order to make room to steal what you want from the other player. Now it belongs to me. Any goods stored in the stash, though, are off limits. There's nothing here. And if you're the defender and you're targeted by a piracy job, then you can stash your goods before initiating your showdown. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? <laughs> when targeted by a piracy job, you can choose to rearrange your goods before initiating the showdown. So if you've got things that you want to move over to your stash section so that they don't get stolen from you if you lose, then this is the time to do it. And you might want to put some of the fuel in your stash too, because it's going to be hard to fly and move around if you don't have any fuel to go to a full burn. Go to maximum war. Push it. I'm giving it all she's got. Power. Why? Because we're out of gas. Some piracy jobs allow you to steal jobs rather than goods. In that case, you can go ahead and steal the jobs, which would bring you up to more than three jobs in your hand. You just have to make sure you discard back down to three by the end of your work turn. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Before finishing the current work action, you'll have to discard down to the maximum three inactive job cards in your hand. Now for the bounty cards, during setup, you're going to place the bounty card deck next to the contact decks on the side of the game, 
and reveal the top three bounty cards from the deck. The three face-up cards form the Versus Most Wanted list. When a fugitive is apprehended and their bounty claimed, then you draw a new card from the top of the deck to add to the new Most Wanted list. There should always be three face-up bounty cards. There is a bounty card for every single wanted crew in the game. So on those crew cards, you've got a little wanted symbol on the bottom of them. And you need to watch out for the Alliance Cruiser in that case, because they'll steal the crew from you. Um, if you if you roll a bad roll, if you roll a one, then they get to take your crew. And you need to watch out for other players when you're playing this the Pirates and Bounty Hunters version of the game, because your other players are gonna try and steal those crew, they're gonna to want to watch out for the Alliance Cruiser and other players, because they're all going after those crew members that you have that are wanted. Another part of the game is every time the Alliance Cruiser reshuffle card is drawn in the navigation deck, you're going to take the three most wanted cards, the bounty cards, and you're gonna put them on the bottom and draw three new cards. So every time you reshuffle the Alliance deck, you're also gonna draw three new bounty cards. These aren't the droids you're looking for. To work a bounty, it's going to be using a work action and you're going to attempt to apprehend a fugitive using your work action. You have to be in the same sector that that fugitive is in. There's three different ways that you can apprehend a fugitive. The first way is from a rival player's crew. To apprehend a fugitive in a rival member's crew, first you have to complete a boarding pass, which we already talked about, so that's going to be either the wrench or the negotiate action uh, roll roll dice, you need either a six, you need a six for a successful boarding. So to pass a boarding challenge, you need to roll a six on the dice, including whatever you get from the wrenches or negotiate icons that you have in your crew. If you have three negotiate icons in your crew, then you only need to roll a three and you pass the boarding check. And then you still have to have a showdown with the crew. So that's the second step is you're gonna have a showdown with the defender's crew. And then if you beat the defender, then you can apprehend the fugitive. The showdown results are detailed on the fugitive's bounty card. The second way of apprehending a fugitive is if the fugitive is in a supply deck on a supply planet. So you gotta go fly to the supply planet and then as your work action, you can work to apprehend the fugitive and you're going to do a showdown between your crew and the fugitive and the player to your right is going to roll as if they were doing a showdown against you like a normal showdown, but they're just rolling for that fugitive. And the third way you can apprehend a fugitive is if the fugitive is already in your crew, you can do a betrayal action and betray the fugitive and get paid. The target fugitive is apprehended without needing to roll for a showdown. However, this act of wanton betrayal will not be taken well by the rest of your crew members and all crew members except your leader become disgruntled. Oh my god, look! It's disgruntled postal workers! When you successfully apprehend the fugitive, you're going to claim the fugitive's crew card and the bounty card. You'll place the fugitive's crew card to the left of your player board with the bounty card on top of it showing that he's been apprehended. Bound by law, fugitives don't count towards your total crew. Bound by law, fugitives do not count towards your active jobs limit. And there's another thing in this game called bounty jumping. So you have to be careful if you have a bounty, if you have a fugitive member on your crew, you've already apprehended them, you still have to watch out because other players can try and come steal that bounty from you. Hey, that's not yours! Yeah, we stole that fair and square! Bounty jumping is attempting to steal a bound fugitive from another player. To bounty jump, you use a work action in the same sector as the ship transporting the bound fugitive. To begin, you must pass a boarding test. You pass the boarding test, then there's a showdown. And then there's a rescue action, which means that you're gonna set the bounty free. So if you don't wanna make money on the bounty and you'd rather have the crew member, you can actually rescue and unbind that crew member and have the crew member join your team. I'm free, I'm free. And that grateful crew member will join your team without you having to pay them the cost. So you don't have to pay the cost to hire the crew member because you freed them and that's payment enough. You owe me your life. All bounty cards have a drop-off location, so if you want to get paid for your bounty, you have to take them to the drop-off location, and that's where you'll get paid. And if you're attacked by a Reaver, anytime a Reaver attacks your ship, if one of your passengers or fugitives gets eaten, then you lose uh, one of your bound fugitives. Help! Reavers! If Reavers kill your passenger and fugitive tokens, then any bound fugitives you're transporting are removed from play. Man, there's a lot of rules in this one. Uh, 
uh, Pirates and Bounties, but we are almost done. So, in the Pirates and Bounties, you will also get these little Haven tokens. They say Haven on one side, and on the other side is a little star with a number in it and those are destination tokens. And they're gonna be used during setup. When you have your story card, there's gonna be some new story cards with the Pirates and Bounties setups, and they'll have spots where you're gonna put these destination tokens for some of the goals of the game and the, and the setup for those story cards. And then on the other side are the Havens. If you're playing one of the story cards that says you're going to start the game with a Haven, instead of placing your ship in the beginning of the game like you would normally start a game, you place a Haven token instead and your ship is always considered to start its starting location from its Haven. And then the Haven will have uh, special attributes for whichever story card that is in the game. All right, so as an example, and this card is pretty cool. I can't wait to play this one. It says it's player versus player focused. So it's gonna be, instead of trying to get to your goal objective, it's gonna be focused on taking out the other players. It says it's a two to three hours, so it's a longer game, and it says it's four experienced players. And the setup, choose Havens. Havens must be placed in border space. After taking starting jobs, pull all remaining piracy jobs from the contact decks and place them in their discard piles. So what that means is now, all those discard piles, those are your shopping piles. You can look through those and pick any fugitive that you want. So now you know where all the fugitives are and you know what your opponent's fugitives are on their ship and you can choose one of those piracy jobs to go after one of your opponents. That's pretty cool. Ships at their haven may not be boarded by rivals, so you're safe on your haven planet. And then there's other things, one man's trash. Use a work action at your haven to drop off sets of four contraband, four cargo, or eight parts. For every complete set you deliver, may take a goal token. You may deliver multiple sets with a single work action. You may only deliver complete sets. Winning the game, the first player with four gold tokens wins the game. So this basically makes this an entirely new game. It's a totally different game. Same, similar game, same world, but a completely different way to play it. That's pretty cool. All right, now we're getting into it because the next expansion is the Blue Sun expansion. The Blue Sun expansion adds a whole nother section to the game board. Right now we've got the full mat, it's the full game board starting from the beginning, but now we have access to this section of the map, which is the Reaver Space. So now we have a new navigation deck called the Reaver Space deck, and we have new story cards, new setup cards, alert tokens. Alert tokens are pretty cool. They can be either Alliance or Reaver alerts, and you have to, if you move into a spot that has alert tokens on it, then you have to roll a dice. And if you lose, then the Reaver comes to your spot or the Alliance ship comes to your spot, and then you have to deal with that. There's a new supply deck. Meridian is a new supply center. So new crew members, new items, lots of cool stuff. There's new leaders, there's new contacts, there's Mr. Universe. There's Lord Haro. Um, there's two new Reaver ships, and there's new Reaver rules. There's a new there's a new setup for the Reavers. Now they're going to be set up in Reaver space um, surrounding Miranda. So the three Reaver ships are going to start off blocking off Miranda. So you can't get to Miranda because you would have to go through Reaver space to get there. But as the Reaver ships move out throughout the game, then it's going to open up the ability to get to the planet Miranda after. Here is the Rim Space deck, so the Blue Sun Expansion Rim Space cards. They look just like that, and there's just new things on there. So Reavers in orbit, new cards, new bad things are gonna happen. Reavers. So first, let's talk about these alert tokens. Reaver ships, when the Reaver ships are moving around the board, if they leave a spot, they leave an alert token behind it. So they're gonna make a trail of alert tokens as they go through the board, and you can end up with more than one alert token on a single spot. And then placing alliance tokens. The alliance cruiser does not generate alliance alert tokens. The alert tokens are usually part of a card. We'll say that now you're gonna have an alert token, and an alliance alert token will go here. In resolving these Alliance Alert tokens and Reaver Alert tokens, whenever your ship ends up in a sector that has the Alliance Alert tokens or Reaver Alert tokens, then you're going to have to make a die roll. You're going to roll a die, and if you're equal to or less than the number of Alert tokens on your die roll, then you got company. If there's three alert tokens and you roll a three, you got company. If you roll a two, you got company. If you roll a one, you got company. If you roll a four or better, then you're safe. And no matter what you roll, all the alert tokens go away. 
So anytime you roll a die, it clears the space. You don't have to worry about that space anymore. Man, it's getting late. Uh, I did not think it was gonna take this long for me to make this video. I've been working on this video for almost two weeks now. Cheers. I hope you enjoy it. This stuff ain't cheap either. No light, no cameras and stuff. I got 49 subscribers right now. Like and subscribe if you like it. Please help me out, help out the channel. And let's get back to it. All right, let's look at some of these blue Meridian supply cards here, the Meridian deck. And we've got a new ship upgrade called Reaverflage. Camouflage for Reaver ships. Ships may move into a sector occupied by a Reaver ship. You have to discard it after losing any crew to the Reavers. You are now camouflaged from the Reavers. Pretty cool. Let's take a look at Mr. Universe and Lord Harrow. We'll start with Mr. Universe here. Mr. Universe has these cards that have either a blue arrow or a red arrow on them. And the blue arrow says legal and the red arrow says illegal. And what these are are new job card additions that say you can add additional terms to your current job card. So you're gonna add this to one of the jobs that you already have that you're working and you can have a plus two misbehave cards for additional bonus money. So bonus money for the jobs you're already working, that's a pretty good deal. Now let's look at Lord Harrow. Lord Harrow has a bunch of new job cards here and they are worth a lot of money, 2,000, 2,800, 3,200, 3,000, pretty decent money for all of these. When you are solid with Lord Harrow, he sells cargo. So you can buy cargo from Lord Harrow and then go sell that cargo to one of the other contacts that you're solid with. So you can just go back and forth, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. Maybe if you have a fast ship and long range, you can just make that your goal to make the money to win the game. And Mr. Universe, if you're solid with Mr. Universe, can't stop the signal. If you are solid with Mr. Universe, you may deal with Mr. Universe from any sector. Can't stop the signal now. That is pretty cool. And he gives you plus two hand size. So from any sector, you now have access to all these bonuses good strategy for this. Hurry up, do one of his jobs first, and then you can deal with him from any sector and add bonuses to any job you get as you travel throughout the game. This might be a good one to go for first. The Mr. Universe cards have legal and illegal and red and blue arrows, and those have to match up and align with whatever job you're going to attach them to. So these are bonus cards that you can attach to one of the jobs and you have to do it when you first work the job. And these count towards the three job cards that you're allowed to have in your hand. So you can pick a bonus one and have it in your hand if you have the space for it, and then attach it to one of the cards that you're going to start working a job. You can't attach this to a job you've already started to work. That would be too much of a bonus. Um, they, they count towards your total hand size. So you have to be careful not to muck up your hand with these. But since maximum hand size is increased when you're solid with Mr. Universe, you have more room in your hand to hold those extra bonus cards. So if you have solid rep with Mr. Universe and you end up getting a warrant issued while you're working one of the jobs, then that job goes away, as does the bonus card that you had attached to the job. If you lose a bonus card, then you lose solid reputation with Mr. Universe. If you're working a job with an attached Mr. Universe card, they're called challenge cards. If you're working a job with an attached challenge card and you have a warrant issued and you lose both cards and your solid contact with Mr. Universe is gone. So then that also means that your maximum hand size goes down so you'll have to discard cards. There's another rule with the Blue Sun expansion called the Meridian Credit Exchange. Along with the Supply Planet Meridian, you also get this Meridian Credit Exchange. It's basically a banking system that says that now in this game you can give money to any player at any time for any reason, even if you're not in the same sector as they are. So there's ATM machines in every sector of the verse, and you can just send money back and forth from your ship to their ship. You see, everyone has their own ATM machine on their ship. 
Really? The fucking thing is one big ATM machine. Everyone just has Venmo. Basically, the Meridian Credit Exchange, AKA the Venmo of the verse. Venmo verse. Oh my gosh, here's the rule. So this came up in a game I just played recently. We're playing this game and I was wondering, I was like, what in the world are goods? And I just found it in the rule book. Sometimes it's hard when you're playing a game, you don't want to stop and read the whole rule book. You want to just keep playing the game. So that's what we did. Sometimes things come up and then you forget about it. You forget to go back and check. I just found it. So what are goods? One of the cards said goods. And I was like, well, is a good a cargo? I guess cargo or contraband are goods. Let's find out. Many of the cards in Blue Sun re refer to goods. Goods are cargo or contraband or fuel or parts. What are goods? Goods are contraband or cargo, same token, just back and forth, or fuel or parts. So not passengers and not fugitives. All right, so the Kalidasa expansion is the one with the little turtle symbol in the bottom, which I think is the coolest looking symbol out of all of them. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie to you. It's like a little Hawaiian turtle symbol, pretty cool. Got new story and setup cards, just like with the rest of the expansions. And there's some more of the Rim Space Nav deck. There's a new supply deck. The new supply deck's called the Beaumont deck. And I'll get that real quick for you and show you that. In the Kalidasa expansion, and on now the right side of the board is the Kalidasa expansion. Remember on the left side of the board, that was the Blue Sun expansion. Now we're in the, the Kalidasa Rim expansion. We come with new story and setup cards. It comes with a new Rim Space Nav deck. Cheers. The Kalidasa Expansion. In the Kalidasa Expansion, you get what's called the Operatives Corvette. The Operatives Corvette is a new ship in the Kalidasa Expansion. And he's right there. And take a look at that. If you come into contact with the Corvette, then you have to resolve this new player aid here, Corvette contact focusing on my face there we go corvette contact resolve when the corvette ends its move in an outlaw ship's sector and when an outlaw ship moves into the corvette's sector so uh, corvette contact remove one of your wanted crew from play gear and ship upgrades that protect crew from wanted crew roles prevent this effect if you see anything that says it's going to protect crew from wanted crew rolls. Those are good cards to have. And then you'll discard all fugitive tokens that are not in your stash. And if you're flying, it's a full stop. So that's what happens with Corvette Contact. Now, how does the Corvette set up? The Corvette sets up, it starts in Cortex Relay 2, which is right over here, Cortex Relay 2. Okay, so there is a rule that you need to know. Corvette trumps Cutter. If the Corvette is ever in the same sector as a Reaver Cutter, the Corvette wins and the Reaver will go to a different sector. And whenever the Corvette goes into a space with Reaver Alert uh, tokens, those Reaver Alert tokens are removed at no cost. And there's a bunch of new navigation cards in the game that will allow the operative's Corvette to move as a consequence of drawing one of those nav cards. And on now the right side of the board is the Kalidasa expansion. Remember, on the left side of the board, that was the Blue Sun expansion, the Kalidasa Rim expansion, and we come with new story and setup cards. It comes with a new Rim Space Nav deck, uh, comes with a Beaumont Supply deck, and the Beaumont Supply deck. Oh, Lord. I left it over there. Hold on a second. Okay, so the Beaumont Supply deck is the one that has these little Chinese balloons and it comes with new crew, new items. That is the Beaumont supply deck. And Beaumont is in the Kalidasa side of the game over here. So Kalidasa, there's Beaumont and there's Fanti and Mingo. Fanti and Mingo. Fanti? Mingo. He's Mingo. He's Fanti. You're Mingo. Our new job cards that you have. Oh man. It is 10 o'clock at night right now, and that means I'm on my third apple cider tonight. It's not apple cider. And we're going to keep going, and hopefully I've got the energy to go through this the rest of the night, because I've been working on this YouTube video for 
almost two weeks now. Kaladasa comes with the Beaumont supply deck. We've got two new job cards. We've got Magistrate Higgins. Magistrate Higgins, I presume. You may. Magistrate Higgins and Fancy and Mingo are the two new contacts in the Kaladasa expansion. Mr. Higgins and Fanti and Mingo. It's Magistrate Higgins, excuse me. Magistrate Higgins gives you one active job when you're solid with him. Or jobs, you just read the job, figure out what it is. Nothing special there, but you get plus one active jobs. Now you can work four jobs instead of just working three jobs. Fanti and Mingo, a lot of people don't know that Fanti and Mingo's last name is Rample, and Fanti is short for Fantastic. Mingo is short for Mingo Jerry. So Fanti and Mingo are actually Fantastic and Mingo Jerry Rample. Fanti and Mingo sell contraband. So if you are solid with Fanti and Mingo, you can buy contraband from them. All right, now we're getting to the Coachworks expansion and the Coachworks expansion comes with two new ships and these two new ships are some of the coolest ones yet because they're bigger. These are big fat fat birds, Some big birds, big flyers right there, look at that, that's a big one, she's a beaut right there, look at her, that's a good one right there, look at that, that is a nice looking ship right there, two new bigger ships, these are about the same size as the Reaver Cutter ships, so they are bigger than the other Firefly ships, they just look like bigger Firefly ships. Um, let's see, so this is the Coachworks expansion. The Coachworks expansion comes with two new ships, the green and the purple, and that's the Esmeralda and Coach. The Coachworks expansion, it's hard to say. Coachworks expansion. The Coachworks expansion comes with the Esmeralda ship and the Jetwash ship. Both of these have a lot of storage space. Look at that. They're bigger ships, more space. The stash, though, you can only hold fuel on the jet wash in the stash. You can't stash anything else except for fuel right here. And on the Esmeralda, same thing, fuel only. Esmeralda stash is only fuel. And the Esmeralda and jet wash each have their own drive cores and they are both fives, so you have a range of five. And when initiating a full burn, you can spend one additional fuel to increase your maximum range by two this turn. So you have to do it when you initiate the burn, and so you would boost your max range from five to seven. And that is on both of those ships, because they're bigger ships, they can go farther, but it costs more fuel. That makes sense. I love games that make sense. This game makes sense. I like it. Take talk about their ship upgrades. So the ship upgrade for Esmeralda, you're gonna start with your two ship upgrades that come on that ship. So you have a full mess deck. During your fly action, you may discard a cargo or contraband to remove disgruntled from all your crew. You can use some of your goods to make your crew happier. Get rid of the disgruntled tokens, that's good. And then your other one is Caravan Pods, and that gives you two extra cargo spots on your ship there. Um, good lighting for that. May hold passengers or fugitives. And you get plus one to your max crew. Plus one to your max crew, you can hold two more cargo spots for passengers or fugitives. There's a little suitcase icon on there. So it's only for passengers or fugitives. Plus one to your max crew. The full mess deck during your fly action, you can discard a cargo or a contraband to remove disgruntled from all your crew. Then for jet wash, this was, this was for Esmeralda. Esmeralda has the full mess deck and the caravan, caravan pods. And that's the purple one. And the green one is the jet wash and Jet Wash comes with two ship upgrades automatically to start with. It has a decoy nav sack cluster. Discard at the start of a move action to treat all nav cards that would normally move a Reaver or Alliance ship as a big black card instead. So anytime you're moving something, instead you get a big black card. 
the Jet Wash also comes with emergency ramjets, and the emergency ramjets say you discard and use an action to initiate a full burn. Throw this away, it counts as an action, but you get a full, bar a full burn. So emergency ramjets may be used in addition to a standard move action. You can fly twice, like double jump. So no matter what, you're discarding this, it's worth 600 for a fly action. We are back to the Coachworks expansion. And the Coachworks expansion also comes with a new leader, Zoe, which has three fight symbols for your skills checks. Rolling a skills check with the pistol symbol, your fight skill check, you have a better chance with Zoe. She's a fighter. That is the new leader card that comes with the Coachworks expansion. There are also new story and setup cards. The Crime and Punishment expansion gives us these new Alliance Alert cards. The Alliance Alert cards, Priority Alert, Alliance Audit. Each time a player completes a job, place this card on that contact's deck. Players may not take a deal action with that contact until this card moves. Another example, Incarceration Order. When resolving Alliance contact, you may remove one of your wanted crew from play instead of paying one warrant's fine. Alliance alerts do different things. From each time a player hires a wanted crew, place this card on that supply deck. Players may not take a buy action at this location until this card moves. Criminal sighting is what that one's called. Each one of these, it's a little flavor, it's just a little extra flavor for the game, and it changes the game a little bit. Introduces 10 new Alliance Alert cards. When an Alert card is in play, there's a new special rule that affects all players. This one says Criminal Sighting. Each time a player hires a wanted crew, place this card on that supply deck. Players may not take a buy action at this location until this card moves. You go to a planet, you go to the supply deck, you do a buy action, and you get a wanted crew. You hire a wanted crew. As soon as that happens, this card goes on top of that supply deck, and you can't go there until this card moves. So someone goes to another supply deck and hires another wanted crew over there, this is going to move to the other supply deck, opening up that first supply deck once again. As you go through the game, you're gonna be playing these Alliance Alerts. When an Alliance Alert gets used or changed, the Alliance Alert is gonna to go to the bottom of the deck when a new one pops up. And that's gonna happen every time the Alliance Cruiser navigation card is drawn. You're going to change the priority alert. So you're gonna take the active one and put it at the bottom of the deck. Depending on the story card, you're going to use a alert card. Some story cards will direct you to start the game with a certain alert card. There's also misbehave cards that will tell you to choose an alert card. There's gonna be a new misbehave card. There's gonna be new wanted crew tokens. So when you draw a card that says your crew is now wanted, you're gonna take this little wanted token and put it on that crew member. Now that is a wanted crew member. There's a few extra little nitpicky rules in here, but nothing major. Now we're going on to the Still Flying expansion. The Still Flying expansion includes new cards for all seven supply decks, new cards for all three nav decks, new cards for the Misbehave deck, as well as three new story cards. There's gonna be some new jobs in the Magistrate Higgins deck and in the Lord Harrow deck. And then there's the Capers deck. Now the Capers deck is a unique set of jobs representing schemes that Saffron has been cooking up and is willing to share with just the right dupe or partner. And there's a new ship, the Restless Soul. Now with the Capers job deck, you can never become solid with her and you can only deal with the Capers deck if you have Deceptive Crew on your ship. The Still Flying expansion, there's something called Deceptive Crew and Deceptive Crew means Yolanda, Saffron, Princess, or whatever alias she's using, that's the Deceptive Crew. So if you have Deceptive Crew, then you can use her job deck. So you gotta have Bridget, Yolanda, Saffron with a little deceptive tag. So you'll replace the original crew with those ones. You don't need to be in a specific sector to take a deal action, but you do need Saffron or one of her aliases to plan with. They may look like crime jobs, but they're actually unique jobs called Capers. Unlike contact decks, the Capers deck has a reshuffle card, just like the misbehaving nav decks. 
if you draw it as part of a deal action, resolve it immediately. Working capers. When you choose to work a caper, you're taking a gamble. Saffron's always working her angle. The payout of her capers is unique. Each job has a base pay, but it can be changed based on the suits of the misbehaves. You proceed past. The new capers deck has some new, unique rules to it, and you just gotta read the card to figure out what it is. And if a deceptive crew ever leaves your ship for any reason, then you have to get rid of any of the jobs that you were working with Yolanda or Bridget. Any of the capers jobs automatically go as well. So there's the Capers deck, which comes with the Still Flying expansion. So the Capers deck payout is gonna have the payout amount and then a plus or a minus. So this one says minus $500 per heart. So in order to do this job, you're gonna have to do four misbehave cards. And if any of those are hearts, then you get a minus $500 for your pay. But maybe another one will have a plus $500 for every diamond and this starts at $3,500, plus $500 for each diamond, so you might get $5,500 for this card, for that job. Now, one thing to note if you use Mr. Universe's bonuses on top of a Capers job card, the misbehave cards that you get on the bonus do not count towards the extra money that the Capers card is gonna pay out. That's a bummer, because that would be even more money. That'd be pretty cool. but. I just had to limit that factor a little bit. So there's another ship upgrade called a shuttle, and the shuttle gives you the ability to work in a sector that is adjacent to the sector that your ship is in. So if your ship's in one sector, you can actually use your ship upgrade that says you have a shuttle to work a job in that adjacent sector. So there's different types of shuttles. So some shuttles might give you more crew, some shuttles might allow you to work a sector that's in an adjacent space. There's different ones and you just have to read what the rules are on that shuttle, but that's a pretty cool little addition to the game for the still flying expansion. And if you're gonna use a shuttle to take an action in a sector, you can ignore alert tokens because a shuttle's smaller than the Firefly, it goes unnoticed, so any alert tokens don't matter to the shuttle. These are the Osiris Shipworks expansions that you're adding with the still flying expansion so these are extra cards for osiris shipworks and three of them one of them is yolanda the other two are or the other three are ship upgrades so this ship upgrade is a doctor's shuttle helps out with medic checks this ship upgrade is anara's shuttle helps out with companion bonuses and plus one to max crew plus one to max crew medic bonuses are doubled this one's Surveyor's Shuttle. This one's pretty cool. Surveyor's Shuttle, once per fly action, you may discard and redraw a navigation card. That's not a bad one to have. That helps you fly without getting stopped. And that brings us to our last and final ship, the Restless Soul. The Restless Soul comes in the Still Flying expansion, and there are nine spots in the cargo hold and three spots in the stash. So about the same size as the original Fireflies like Serenity. All right, guys, we made it. We're at the last one. This is the 10th anniversary collector's edition. Extra things to add to the game. So last expansion right here. Let's go through it. Optional rule, Gaul Um There's a new dice that includes a disgruntled symbol instead of a number one. So all the dice that came in this 10th anniversary set have a disgruntled symbol instead of a number one. So you can see there is the disgruntled token symbol. During setup, if you decide if rolling a disgruntled face just counts as a one, or if it instead results in one of the following options, disgruntled crew, um, proceed or not, some twists. So there's just different things, different ways you can set up the game. So optional rules if you want to use that. Optional rule for unique ship upgrades. Adding a sky hook to Serenity, adding exterior cargo to Serenity, different things. Then there's some new flying solo cards, optional setups, and that's pretty much it. Not any new rules for the 10th expansion. The 10th expansion just adds more cards. We went through all that before. So if you watched my previous video, it shows you everything that comes in it. Not a whole lot other than some new cards. You get every promo card ever released. So the 10th anniversary collector's edition comes with comes with every promo card ever released. A ton of new content. There's new, new leaders. There's new story cards. There's new setup cards. There's new job cards. There's some more supplies for the rim. There's some more bounties. I guess there were some bounties missing from the previous from the Pirates and Bounties expansion. So the missing ones are added in. And some unique ship up 
upgrades for the old ships, a lot of optional rules, and a bunch of flying solo uh, game cards. So lots of ways to play solo if you like to play solo. This game's fun. I, I played this game solo already once and it was a lot of fun and I wouldn't mind playing it again solo. As lame as that sounds, it's fun. I mean, when you play a video game, you're playing it at solo, right? What's the difference between that and this? Except you use your brain more than this. Better than TV, TV, video games, ah, melt your brain. This, this builds brain muscle. All right, so we've gone over how to set up and play the entire game. And now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about game strategy. So first we're gonna go over some tips and tricks that were given with the 10th anniversary rule book. They give you a little set of tips and tricks. So I'll run down those really quick. And then after that, I'm gonna tell you about some strategies that I found online and on Board Game Geek, and I will give credit to the people who came up with these strategies. Then I'll just talk about a little bit of my own strategy. Maybe I'll start out with my own strategy first after the book here. So we'll do the book first. I don't know, I'm a little indecisive, it's late. Let's do the book first. Okay, so tips for surviving the verse, no fuel, no go run out of gas, you're drifting, always take a few more fuel than you think you need for a trip to handle emergency course changes, unexpected opportunities. That's smart to have a little extra fuel. You don't wanna run out of fuel. I say that when you're heading out from a planet, you should have at minimum four fuel just in case because you might be going to a planet that doesn't have a supply and you might have to go somewhere else after that. So I would say at minimum, always have at least four fuel when you're leaving a supply planet after you do a buy action. Make sure you always have at least four fuel. I would say at least one part. So at minimum, have four fuel, one part when you leave a supply planet. I would say if you wanna play it safe, six fuel, two parts, just like you do when you start the game. Pilots, better to have them and not need them. Basically, this just tells you that if you're looking for pilots, the Space Bazaar is the place to go. You're most likely to find pilots at the Space Bazaar. So that is also where Amandul is. Uh, mechanics keep you flying. Persephone is where you're gonna find mechanics and Persephone is also where you find Simon Tam and River Tam, which I think are two of the best crew in the whole game. As of right now, I think both of them together are the best crew in the whole game. And I'm gonna tell you why, because if you have, Simon's missing, I lost Simon, but here's River. River is gifted. Before each test roll, if you roll a one to a two, you return to the ship. If you roll a three, then you get an extra two guns for that test roll. If you roll a four, you get an extra two mechanic symbols. If you roll a five, you get an extra two negotiate symbols. And if you roll a six, you get three of any one of those chosen skills. Now, if you have Simon Tam along with River Tam, if you have both of them together, Simon Tam gives a plus two bonus to all of her rolls. So now there's no chance you're gonna return to the ship and there's always a chance you're gonna give at least a plus two benefit to a skill roll and if you roll a three, or a three becomes a five because everything's plus two. If you roll a three, that's a negotiate. If you roll a four or more, then you basically get to choose three of any chosen skill. So you can choose a skill and you get plus three to that chosen skill for your skill roll. That is huge, plus three of any skill. 50% chance that you're gonna get plus three of any skill if you have River Tam and Simon Tam on your ship. And while you're on Persephone, you can pick up a, a mechanic too. So Persephone is a great planet to start off on or near. All right, another good tip is if you're going to be doing a misbehave deck action, like if you're going for a lot of Niska jobs or if you're doing anything where you know you're gonna be going for that misbehave deck, it's a good idea to have a transport. If that's gonna be your goal, try not to pass up a transport opportunity. Snag a transport, it's gonna be worth it because you're gonna need one on one of your misbehaved cards I guarantee it all right there's a few different supply decks that have a crybaby the crybaby is crybaby is just a good card to have it's a good card to have because when you're in the sector with an alliance cruiser you can discard the crybaby to ignore the alliance cruisers effects and move the cruiser one sector within alliance space so this is your get out of jail free card for alliance space if you're going to be bringing any contraband or any fugitives through Alliance Space or you're cruising through there with some wanted crew, you want to have a crybaby on you. 
As I mentioned earlier, having Simon Tam and River Tam in your crew is a really good idea because River Tam can help out with all three different types of skill checks that you need the gun, the wrench, and negotiate. That's one of the strategies in this game that's gonna be an important thing is you wanna be prepared for all three of those skill roles at any time in the game. So you want to have a well-rounded crew. That's the key to this game. I would say that you want to have a minimum of the ability to guarantee yourself a five on a skill check for every single skill. What that means is if you roll a die and you get a one, then you better have four of whatever that symbol is. So you want a minimum in your crew and in your items of four of each symbol. So if you have River Tam in your crew, then you're guaranteed to have a two of each symbol just from her, or a possibility, a possibility of a two of each symbol just from her and a 50% possibility of whatever you want from her, three of those symbols. So then you just need a couple of the other ones. That's that part of the strategy, just have a well-rounded crew, have probably at least four symbols of each pistol, wrench, and negotiate. Unfortunately, another strategy for this game is just knowing what's in each supply planet. If you own this game or you play this game on a regular basis, it would behoove you to flip through those supply decks either right before the game just to re-familiarize yourself with what's in each one so you know where the pilots are, where the mechanics are, where certain crew members are like River and Simon, you know, are in Persephone, you know, you have mechanics in Persephone, you know, you have pilots in the Space Bazaar. You wanna know where the transports are if you're gonna wanna transport. Uh, so flip through those decks ahead of time, know where things are, it's a good strategy. Uh, another thing about this game is just plan ahead. So you're gonna have one job that's gonna take you from one side of the galaxy to the other side of the galaxy. If you look through your cards and you see, well, if I make a little detour this way, I can get this job started. Started. and I'll make another little detour this way, get this job started. I know that probably seems like common sense. It was common sense to me, but gotta say it anyway. It's uh, important to take that into consideration. Don't just do one job at a time. Look at all your jobs. This is about getting the most done and the least amount of actions because this game's a race. No matter what the goal is, this game is a race to get those goals completed. And on the topic of it being a race, you don't want to spend too much time in one spot trying to get what you want. If you're hanging out in Persephone because you really want a mechanic or you really want River and Simon, you're just taking turn after turn after turn and you're not working, you're not doing anything, everybody else is starting to work, you're going to waste a lot of time. Just keep that in mind. Like go for it a little bit, but if you're not getting what you're wanting, like it's tough because the more you go through, the more likely they're gonna be the next one. It's a gamble. Another thing, this isn't really game strategy, but just making the game go faster because this is a long game. You want it to keep going, you want it to go fast. Every single player you add to the game is gonna add 30 minutes at least to the game length. The story cards that say these are two to three hour games are just like any other game out there. You can add 50% to it. If it's a two to three hour game, it's gonna be three to four, maybe even five hours, depending on how many players you have. Keep that in mind when you're playing, when one person's taking their turn, everybody else that's watching that turn, especially if you're the next player, make sure you know what you're doing ahead of time so that everybody else doesn't have to wait on you. If everybody does that, then this game will go very fast and it won't take forever. That is the key to having a good experience with this game is that it doesn't drag. You wanna help it not drag by being a good player and a good friend to your companions. Think ahead when the turn comes to you, you already know what you're doing. You're ready to go. You knock it out, bap, 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 bap. Explain what you're doing, finish your turn, bam, next turn, and that person does the same thing. Bam, 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 this is what I'm doing. Okay, next turn. Each turn, if each turn only takes, you know, two or three minutes, that's pretty good. But if you're having five minute turns per person, and you got a four player game, you got 20 minutes between turns. That's not good. Another thing that helps to keep things moving is if each person has their own job. So make one person the banker, they do all the banking stuff. Make one person the nav deck person and they're dealing out all the nav decks, reading them, putting them in the discard pile, whatever. Whoever's nearest the supply decks can be in charge of the supply decks. Whoever's nearest the contact decks on the other side of the table, they're helping out with the contact decks. You got one person 
doing the bank and the tokens and the other person is doing all the nav decks and the misbehaved deck. Another thing that's cool about this game is it is house rule friendly. In fact, most of the story cards, most of everything are just people making up their own house rules of how to change this game, use the same game mechanics, but make a new game out of it with new things you're starting out with. If you're trying to make this game easy for players coming into it, there's a good suggestion in the book that says for a quick start with fewer decisions before each player's first buy action, allow them to draw cards from the supply deck until they have three crew cards or crew cards with a value of 600, whichever comes first. Any gear or ship upgrades are placed in the discard pile. Not only does each player start with crew, but there will likely be some good stuff in the discard piles. Before each player's first buy action, you can draw cards from the supply deck until they have three crew cards or crew cards with a value of 600, whichever comes first. The book also says it's okay to mix other rules. Don't be afraid to mix and match interesting rules from story and setup cards. Just realize they could have an unexpected impact, so some rules and setup cards may not work well together, but you're free to mix and match whatever you want. Having a sense of what's in each deck is very helpful. So I talked about this before already. Knowledge is power. If you want a pilot or a mechanic, don't waste your time at Silverhold. Looking for a crime? Don't bother Harkin or Amandul. Consider putting together or even seeking out player aids that track this kind of information as long as that doesn't interfere with your enjoyment of learning the game. So that's not a bad idea to do the research. This game is similar to a lot of games, even, even chess. Even though there's no luck in chess, chess is all just strategy, and that's why I love chess. The more you play the game and the more you know the game, the better you're gonna know where things are. So the more you know the decks, where to go. That's gonna give you an edge up on everybody else. So study your decks, know what's in them, know where you need to go, and you'll be ready. The first tip I would give is just like anybody starting out with a new game, if you're introducing this game to somebody else, don't show them the whole game. Start with just the core set, with the basic rule, do the one hour game, first person to whatever it was, $15,000 wins, get it over with in an hour, hour and a half, and then come back on a second night when they're excited about it, but when you add the other expansion, like the Pirates and Bounty Hunters, where you're battling each other or you're making the board twice as big. You probably don't have to do one expansion at a time, I think you can figure out how to play this game pretty quickly and maybe add two or three expansions at a time to the point where first time you play the game, play the core game, add a couple expansions, two or three, play it again, add another expansion, play it again. You can probably get all the way to the full game after your fourth game. I think right now I played, what, four games? I haven't played yet with, the, with all of it, but I feel like after doing this video, I'm right about there. Another thing is don't ever give up in this game. Even if you are very far behind, there are elements of this game where the person who's in the lead could all of a sudden just crash. You might have something that just gives you a huge boost. So you're never out of the game. Keep fighting tooth and nail. You can come back. This is, this is a game that has a lot of strategy, but it also has some pretty serious luck bombs thrown in there. So you gotta be careful of those. So this is not a beginner friendly game. This is not a gateway game. This is a game that if you are trying to bring somebody into it that's never played a serious board game before, I wouldn't start with this one. I would start with something a little easier. Start with Splendor, start with some gateway games. This is a lot to get into and it's a lot of think. Even though it's not that complex, it's very simple. Everything is easy to understand. So it is and it isn't a beginner friendly game. It is beginner friendly because it's easy to understand. It's not beginner friendly because it is big. It is complex, it's widespread. It's not complicated, but there's a lot of moving parts, so it can become a little complicated. And it's a lot for people that aren't ready for a complex game. So if you've got someone new, start with just the core, just the base game. Now I'm gonna go over one of the Board Game Geek threads I found by Landon Summer. So thank you, Landon. All right, so Landon Summer breaks this down pretty nicely for the first contacts in the game. Anyway, he goes through Harkin, Amandul, Patience, Badger, and Niska. And Harkin is the cheapest. He gives you the least pay for the jobs, but they're all lawful, so you don't have to worry about running afoul of the law. He's got a pretty neat strategy here. He says, if you use Burgess, 
He can load a free cargo when you complete a shipping job, so that helps you with Harkins jobs since most of them are shipping jobs. They pay $500 to $900, and you don't need a whole lot of crew. All you're doing is shipping one thing from one place to another, so you don't have to hire crew, you don't have to search for crew, you can just start off with this strategy right away and start making some money pretty quickly because you're not having to pay your crew a cut, it's pure profit, you don't have to travel across the map, most of the jobs are pretty close, short missions so you can just do during one fly, and then you get the benefit from having reputation with Harkin, your papers are in order, that helps you out when flying through nav space. The only two downsides are if you're given a warrant for any reason, you lose reputation with him. So anytime you want to do a job, you have to hunt down that Alliance Cruiser, which moves around during the game. Not a bad strategy for starting out, but then you probably want to move on to something else. Amon Duel is the next one. He pays anywhere from $1,000 to $2,500. They're a little harder than Harkin. Still pretty pretty easy for beginning crew. Monty is probably the best captain for Amon missions. He gains an extra $500 from smuggling missions and he has most of the skills needed for Amon smuggling missions along with a few keywords that will pay out extra as well. He has several illegal jobs but if you have a moral crew he's the man to get missions from. He has no immoral jobs, none, zero, not a zip, etc. His reputation benefit doesn't seem to shine as much as the others. Also Amon pays $600 for cargo sitting in your hold which is the best price in the game. Then we go on to Patience. Patience pays $1,600 to $3,000 for her jobs. She's got a good mix of everything. Most of her jobs only require two or less misbehaved cards. If you have a conservative crew, that helps. Not much else to say about patience than Badger, anywhere from $1,500 to $4,000, but better than patience. Malcolm's a good captain to have for Badger jobs because of all the crime keywords. If you're looking for explosives, fancy duds, transport, those are all keywords that you'll need to start and finish his jobs. But to succeed with the Badger jobs, you will need a little bit of a bigger crew, so you need to make sure that you've got more well-rounded, more, more of the symbols that you need. The misbehaved cards required are a little bit higher. And then we go on to Niska. Niska pays anywhere from $3,500 to $6,000 for his jobs. He pays the most, but he's also the most dangerous person to work for, and he's going to have most of the misbehaved cards out of all of them and Malcolm is a perfect candidate for the leader on his jobs. Walmack, Nandy, and Marco would also be great choices for his missions as well. Walmack gains an extra 500 on immoral jobs, Marco buys explosives and firearms at half price, and Nandy recruits crew for free. All of those abilities pay off. You gotta know your decks. He pays $800 for contraband. So you could load up a bunch of contraband from Fancy and Mingo and head across the galaxy. It's a long way to fly, but you go from Fancy and Mingo to, Nin to Niska with a whole bunch of contraband. You're buying the contraband for $400 and you're selling it for, you're selling it to Niska. You're selling it to Niska for $800. So you double your money just shipping back and forth. It's pretty good. You could also do that with the cargo. So if you buy cargo from Lord Haro sells cargo for 300. So if you go from Lord Haro, so I'm on dual pays the most. So you could also double your money going from Lord Harrow to I'm on dual, probably about the same distance, doubling your money, but 300 to 600 versus 400 to 800, $400 per spot if you're selling contraband to Niska versus $300 per spot if you're selling cargo to Amandul. So you're better off doing the contraband to Niska. Another thing, if you're doing Niska jobs, you definitely wanna have a cry baby cry ship upgrade. All right, so I've gone over some of the strategies I found on the internet and on BGG, and I've gone over the tips in the book. I've given my two cents here and there on those strategies and a few of my own. The only other thing I would say is that right now, if I was to pick my go-to strategy for this game. It would be get to a supply planet that has what I want. So right now I'm thinking probably Persephone would be my choice because I want hopefully my ship leader. I would choose a ship leader that has a good either negotiate or firearm skill or both. And then I'm going to be getting a mechanic from Persephone. So that is uh, that covers a little bit of all three of those skills. And then if I can get River Tam and Simon, if I can get Simon Tam and River Tam both, plus a mechanic at Persephone along with my captain, then I should be doing pretty good. How do you do that? In the game, you can do two actions of your four actions every turn. 
and you can just sit on that one planet and your first action can be a buy action, you know, buy whatever you want, but you're searching through the deck. So flip through the deck, you can go through three cards at a time and find what you're looking for. Mechanic, Simon, and River. Your second action is gonna be just a work action where you will take $200. Look at three cards, take $200. Next person's turn comes back around to you, Look at three more cards, take $200. Goes around, comes back to you. Look at three more cards, take $200. Eventually, you're gonna find a mechanic, Simon and River, and you snag them, and maybe you found some good, useful items along with that. Go ahead and spend your $3,000 that you start out with if you have to spend it all, because you're better off with getting a nice, good crew and jumping over to Niska and starting the game strong with a strong crew and, and knocking out those misbehaved cards easily and making a lot of money on on his uh, on Niska. All right, here we are, it's the next day. Good morning. The last thing we did was we went over how to set up and play the entire game. And I went over game strategy and went over the things I researched on the internet, board game geek threads, to see what other people's strategies were. I gave you my own two cents on my own strategy. Now I'm gonna talk about what I like about the game, what I didn't like about the game, and where this game ranks on my list. As far as my collection goes, where is it? Is it number one? Is it top 10? Um, so let's start off with what I like about the game. Number one is it's fun. This game actually makes you feel like you're in the show or in the movie, in the Firefly series. You feel like you really are Malcolm Reynolds. You, you feel like you really did just pick up some fugitives. You feel like you really are trying to hightail it away from the Alliance. You feel like this is the game. It's not just some Euro game that they slapped uh, IP on. This is actually, you are playing the TV show as best as they could have. I don't, I don't think that I could have improved on it in any way. I can't think of anything that I would do differently about this game to make it better. I mean, this is really a well done game as far as making you feel like you are playing the show, Firefly. Number two is it's simple-ish. Starting out, the game's very simple as far as when you play the core game, the base game, everything makes sense. And then when you add each expansion one at a time, each one is a simple addition with some extra rules thrown in there. And if you, if you start, if you were to start playing this game the first time you ever played it with everything, you would, it would be a headache. It would be too much. It would be too complex. But starting off with the core game, everything makes sense. It's very simple. And then when you go step by step from there on, everything makes sense every the pay money to buy a firearm you pay money to hire crew you pay money to do that you have to pay your crew when you do a job you got to give them their cut it all makes sense if you ever come across a point in the game where you don't know what to do and it's not explained in the rules I think they want you to just kind of make a common-sense judgment call as far as a house rule goes and I haven't seen anything come up yet where I've had to make a house rule but if that were to be the case I think you would just make a house rule on whatever makes the most sense because that's how they built the game it's it's really a well well designed game um, number three reason why I like this game is making money if anybody likes Monopoly and likes that aspect of Monopoly where you get to try and make as much money as you can this is a game like that you're you're building your wealth you're building your empire you're doing what you can to make the most money that's fun uh, number four is replayability so replayability in this game is huge every single story card gives you a different goal it's going to change the game almost entirely as far as how you win what your goals are every every time you play this game you're going to be playing it completely differently based on the story card and every time you play the game you're going to be playing it completely differently because you're gonna get a different crew. You're gonna get a different captain. You're gonna be using a different ship. You're gonna be the, the luck of the draw of the cards or what happens with border space and alliance space. Everything's gonna be a little bit different. The replayability in this game is huge. You could, this, this game, you could probably play a hundred times and you would still wanna play more because there's gonna be something new. There's gotta be probably around 30 story cards. Tons of replayability for a game this big is pretty cool. Number five, upgrades. Upgrades to mitigate risk slash Chance, I like games that have upgrade abilities and this has crew. Crew do your upgrades or your items do your upgrades. And what those upgrades are is it mitigates your chance, mitigates your risk when you're going for those 
dice rolls. So you're doing a dice check on uh, mechanic or medic check, uh, negotiate, uh, firearm, a battle. And when you're rolling your dice, if you have more pistols and more crew that are good at fighting, then you're gonna have a better chance at winning that battle. You're upgrading, you can also upgrade your ship, have more crew, have more cargo space, um, have a better engine so you can fly farther. That's fun, that's awesome. It does cost a lot of money though, so you gotta make the money so that you can buy the upgrades, so that you can have a better ship, so that you can do better in the game. And then you realize that the game's a race and how much time are you gonna spend going for your upgrades versus making money. Every time you buy an upgrade, that costs money. You gotta be smart with it. And that brings us into uh, the next one, multiple viable strategies. So there's multiple strategies in this game that can work depending on the story, go for a uh, no crew strategy where you just start making money right away to try and stick to types of jobs where you don't need a large amount of crew, but you can knock out job, 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 job really quickly, make some money really quick. Maybe you'll get lucky and, and take off and be in the lead and the people that are going for crew won't be able to catch up in time before you win the game. Other strategies are just sitting on a planet and going through and getting the best crew, finding all the best crew and then going for those high priced, the, the high priced job cards. And that's a good strategy too. The next one, the next thing I like about the game is you can choose whether or not you want to cooperate or versus battle against the other players in the game. So the game starts out, the base game is very cooperative. Not very cooperative, it's a race. So you're not really cooperating and you should be trying to hinder the other players, but you could play nice and be nice with where you move the Reaver ship and where you move the Alliance ship, how you play the game and whether you, you're doing trades. When you add the Pirates and Bounties expansion, that makes this game very cutthroat. So you can choose whether or not you wanna add that expansion. You can add other expansions without adding that expansion. It doesn't matter which expansions you add for the most part you can choose, but that's one, the Pirates and Bounties. If you want more of a cutthroat player versus player battling, you gotta make sure that someone isn't gonna come attack you. Make sure you're far enough away, make sure you go to a haven, those types of things. Um, I'm excited to play the Pirates and Bounties because I haven't played a Pirates and Bounties version of this game yet, but it sounds like a lot of fun and I am excited to try that. Another thing I like about this game is that even with the best strategy, anything could happen. You could have the you, you could have gone to the to the planets, gotten your crew, got the best crew, got the best upgrades, everything's been going your way, you've been winning, you have all the money, and then you're coming across and you've got all the contraband, you're about to you're about to win the game, and bam, you get that alliance space. You don't have the uh, you don't have the crybaby, you go through alliance space, you get that reshuffle card, the alliance cruiser comes to your sector. All your contraband is gone, and now what? Now you have to go all the way across the board again. You lost everything. You had to pay, you had four warrants. This happened to me. You had four warrants. You had to pay $4,000 because you had four warrants. Now you have the, the lowest amount of money. Now everybody else is beating you. The tides can turn in this game rather quickly. So, and that's just like real life. In real life, sometimes you're doing good, something hits you, and bam, you're knocked on your ass. This is a game that is it's fun because it's realistic and chance takes a toll sometimes. Anything can happen, even with the best strategy, anything can happen. So don't give up. If you're in the if you're in last place, don't give up because anything can happen. The last thing I want to say about what I like about the game is that it truly tells a story. I kind of went into this with the theme part of what I like, but it, it truly tells a story and every time you play it tells the story a little bit differently. You're changing the way the Firefly game actually or the Firefly show actually went. You're playing the game and you're creating a new episode of the show every time you play. It's like you're recreating a new episode of the show, which brings me to what I don't like, and that's the fact that Fox canceled Firefly. If they wouldn't have canceled Firefly, I bet this show would still be running today. I mean, Firefly, in my opinion, the, the move, the Serenity, Joss Whedon, acting, everything about this show was brilliant, and I think that today, Firefly would be just as big a name as Star Wars, if not bigger. I mean, this this had potential to be rivaling Star Wars, and it's a shame that the show got canceled. And that's where the benefit of the game is, it's like we're continuing the show. Anybody who's a true Firefly fan, if you have this game, you are doing your part to continue the show, and every time you play, you're creating a new episode in the show. 
and it feels like you're really in that world. The other bad thing about the game is it is a long game. When you are inviting someone new to the game, hopefully they've already a Firefly fan that will help. The teach isn't too bad because the teach is pretty simple for the base part of the game, but don't expect someone brand new to the game to jump right in and do all the expansions with you. Start them off with the base game because it, it takes a while to play. Even the smallest, shortest story that says it takes one hour, that's probably one hour if you're playing a two-player game and you already know the rules. If you are having a four-player game and you're including a teach, then you can expect that shortest game to be at least two hours. Keep that in mind. Long game, it's really not that bad. It's not that complex. I've seen a lot worse games, a lot more complex than this, that are mind-numbingly confusing. This is not that. This is not a mind-numbingly confusing, what am I even doing? What kind of strategy is this? I don't even know what I'm doing here. That's not what this is. In this game, you know what you're doing. All the rules make sense, the additional rules make sense, and you're gonna figure out how it all works together in the game as you're playing. It's not gonna be that hard to add on each expansion. The bad thing is, it is a long game. It's a bit of a setup, it's a bit of a table hog, as you can see, so make sure you've got a big table. What I don't like is just that it's a long game and that they canceled Firefly. The next thing I'm going to talk about is where this game ranks in my current collection. So right now I've got a collection, I don't even know, probably between 70 and 80 board games in my collection right now, and I'd say at least a third of them are in the Board Game Geek Top 100. So I do play a lot of the games that are in the Board Game Geek Top 100, and if I don't own the game, I have played a lot of the ones that are also on there. So I've got a, a good amount of knowledge of the games that Board Game Geek says are the best games out there, which I disagree with a lot of their choices, but I think everybody has their own preferences when it comes to board games. I like games that have a lot of strategy. I also don't mind luck, so I'm not somebody who's going to hate a game because it has luck involved and not just strategy. I'm also not going to hate a game if there's zero luck and only strategy. I like those games too. Um, some of my favorite games, if I were to tell you right now, just to have an idea, this is in no particular order, but I like Star Wars Rebellion, I like Kemet, I like Seven Wonders, I like Axis and Allies, I like Euro games, I like Viticulture, I like Wingspan, I like Seven Wonders Duel, I love Splendor. Splendor is one of the games that really started getting me into gaming. Let's see, Onatama. Onatama's a fun little game. These are all my two player games over here. Dice Throne, I like Dice Throne. Undaunted, I like the Undaunted series of games. So anyway, there's a glimpse into the games that I like. Where does this game rank? This game right now, if I were to make a top 10 list, probably expect this game to be on that list right now. I don't know how high it would be. I don't think I would pick it as number one just because I haven't played this game enough yet to say that it's number one, but I think that it has the potential to be a number one favorite game. I know there's a lot of people out there that have this game and it is their number one favorite game of all time. I haven't played it enough to make that distinction, but I can say that if I was to venture a guess right now, if I was to rank all my games right now, this would probably be on my top 10 right now. I've finished going over what I like about the game, what I don't like about the game, where it ranks in my current board game collection. Stick around real quick and I'm gonna do a explanation of where this channel is going from here and board game giveaways, my plans for this channel moving forward. So please stick around and we'll talk about that next. All right. I'm gonna use this as a prop to tell you my plans for the channel going forward. Let me make sure I'm opening it the right way. So, set of poker chips right here. I'm gonna talk about game giveaways. So my plan for this channel going forward, this is a small channel, this is brand new. I'm just starting out. Operation Game Table, my plan for this channel is to focus on game strategies. I'm thinking about doing a series on chess because I started out playing chess. I want to be able to teach my kids how to play chess. I thought it'd be cool to have a little side video on chess. And I think that there's a lot that you can learn from how 
many books there are on chess, chess openings, chess tactics, chess strategies, end game, all those things, and you can incorporate that with how you play other games. Every game has openings. You wanna be able to know how to have a good strategy for every game there is, including um, the openings, the strategies and tactics in the mid game. You wanna know how to play the end game. Every game, I think you can do that to a little bit. That's my goal for this channel, to focus on game strategy, but I'm also going to do top tens, reviews, playthroughs, and I'd really like to get to where I'm doing some like exciting playthroughs of games where you can just see how much fun it is to play a game. You can watch us play a game, you can learn how to play the game with us while we learn how to play a game. I think that would be fun all around. In order to get this board game channel off the ground, I need subscribers, I need to hit monetization. That happens at 1,000 subscribers. Right now I'm at 51 as of the filming of this channel. And so I'm gonna use these poker chips as an example of my plan for doing board game giveaways. I'm gonna use board game giveaways when I hit certain subscriber levels. It's not a bribe. Of course it's a bribe. The first one is gonna be at 100. So right now I'm at 51. As soon as I hit 100 subscribers, the next video I make, I will do a board game giveaway. And I already have the first board game picked out because I have two copies of this game because I like it so much. And that's another thing. I'm not gonna be doing a board game giveaway of games that I don't think you're gonna like. I'm gonna be doing board game giveaways of games that are good, that I like, that I stand behind, that I know people are gonna have fun playing. And that's why I'm choosing the games that I'm choosing for my game giveaways. So the first board game giveaway is going to be at 100 subscribers. I'm using the $1 chip to signify 100 subscribers. 100 times each of these chip amounts are when I'm going to do another board game giveaway. So I'll do a video, I'll explain in the video how I'm going to run the giveaway. And I'm basically, you have to be subscribed and you have to leave a comment, you know, whatever the game is that I'm giving away. I'll have a, I'll have a code word in the comment, you leave that code word in the comment, and then I'm gonna pick one of the people at random. The $1 chip means 100 subscribers, so I'm gonna give a game away at 100 subscribers. Then we've got a $5 chip here, so at 500 subscribers, I'll do my second game giveaway, and then I'm gonna give away two games because it's my second game giveaway. We'll give away two games at 500 subscribers. Then when we get to the $25 chip, that's 2,500 subscribers, I'll give away three games. Then when we get to the $50 chip, that is 5,000 subscribers, I'm going to give away four games. And then when we get to the $100, chip. The $100 chip is going to be for 10,000 subscribers and I'm going to give away five games. I think the $500 chip would be 50,000 subscribers. So the $500 chip is 50,000 subscribers and I might jump up to maybe do like a 10 game giveaway at that point because that's a pretty big number, 50,000. Or maybe I'll do seven or eight, something like that. And then at 1,000, um, the $1,000 chip will be for 100,000 subscribers and when I get there I'll do some big big blowout big game giveaway 20 game giveaway something like that so anyway each one of these giveaways is going to be um, increasing number of games and increasing number of winners so the one game giveaway is going to go to one person the two the two game giveaway will go to two different winners so each winner will get one game the three game giveaway, I'll pick three winners. Each one of those winners will get one game and so on and so forth. As the channel progresses, I think that would be a way for me to pay it forward saying thank you for the subscriptions. Thank you for helping me get my way to monetization. And every video I make, this is my commitment to you. Every video I make, I'm going to work on making it better than the last. I'm new to this. I'm, I've never been a creator before. I have no idea what I'm doing on YouTube and I am started out just doing it for fun and my last video kind of took off a little bit so I'm excited about that and I'm gonna work on um, doing better, getting better with my video editing, getting better with my equipment that I have. As far as going forward, I do wanna focus on strategy so every game that I talk about on this channel, I wanna focus on strategy more than any other 
of the board game channels that are out there are talking about. That's one thing I've noticed that seems like it's lacking in other board game channels is that they don't talk about strategy enough in the game. They talk about what they like, what they don't like, but they're not talking about strategy. So I wanna focus on strategy, give you tips, tactics, teach you how to win, teach you how to play well. The next videos that I plan on making, I think my next video I'm gonna make is gonna be a top 10 video. It might be my top 10 favorite games of all time, or it might be a top 10 casual games or party games, something like that, but probably do a top 10 list for my next video. So I should be able to get that one out quicker than this one took. This one took quite a while. I'm gonna keep doing some unboxings. Anytime there's a new game that comes out that I want and I buy, as soon as I get it, I'll do an unboxing video and show you what's in the game, talk about the game, go into game strategy. I'm gonna do videos in the future about game nights and playthroughs, and then I'll keep you updated. I'll try to keep you updated at the end of my videos on where I am in monetization, how many subscribers I have, and how close I am to getting monetized, and see if you guys can help me out with that. The best thing you can do to help me out is to like, subscribe, share my video so that other people subscribe to me. Please like, subscribe, share the video, and hit the bell notification so that you know when a new video comes out so you can watch it, and leave comments. Leave comments down below. One of the things that I was hoping for was to get some feedback from you guys on type of channel you'd like. I was thinking about taking a more sophisticated approach and like wearing a nice suit, uh, but I'm also a US Navy veteran and I like wearing the grunt style shirts and representing the fact that I was in Operation Iraqi Freedom and I am a veteran and I support the United States of America and I support veterans and uh, regardless of the politics of what's going on in the world, we need to do what we can for, for our people and for our country. So supporting that I like. I'm more comfortable wearing the grunt style shirts, but if you leave in the comment suit versus grunt style, make a comment down below. If you want to see me in my suit, if you look down in my profile picture, you'll see what I look like in my suit. That's my suit that I wore for my wedding, and it's a little bit more sophisticated, a little, little more dapper. If you think that that's the direction I should go for this channel, a little more, a little more proper, sophisticated. Um, let me know if you think casual is the way to go with the grunt style shirts, say grunt style. So suit versus grunt style, leave a comment down below, let me know what you think, and uh, I'll see you on the next video. Thanks, bye.